A lot of times telling these stories on the Jabber Chronicles, there is some greater point to make about the wrestling industry, through the lens of one of its practitioners. Whether that be modern wrestling losing its sense of electric organic chaos in favor of pretty packaging and stale dialogue, or wrestling's unusual relationship with objective reality in the form of kayfabe, or a quote-unquote jobber learning to survive in a world where his kind was mostly extinct. Generally, when I do research for these videos, the opportunity to make some greater point about this bizarre and wonderful business naturally arises. This is not really one of those times. There, there's nothing really dramatic or controversial here, but I did want to tell this story anyway because I just see it as an, a success story. It's just the story of a Tennessee boy who got into wrestling, had some success, left while his body was still healthy, and became a successful local businessman in his town. This is the story of one of those guys that just seems to have done it right. Maybe he was never a superstar. Maybe he's not a Hall of Famer. But you know, who cares? You don't have to be LeBron James. It's still pretty awesome to be Steve Blake. For every Shaquille O'Neal or Kobe Bryant, there's a Derek Fisher who was the best player ever at his high school and became a solid contributor at the elite level. And that's still an amazing accomplishment. This is the story of Reno Riggins. Welcome to the Jobber Chronicles. This story begins at Opryland, a now defunct theme park once located next door to the Grand Ole Opry. One of the attractions of the park was a musically based variety show where the main players would bring kids down out of the crowd, dress them like cowboys, and put them in the role of hero or villain, making them, you know, either the bank robber or the sheriff, tasked with bringing them to justice. One of those young lads pulled into the Opryland variety shows was a boy by the name of Neil Hargrove, who gained an early love of being in front of people, of performing, of feeling the electricity and the roar of the crowd. Hargrove grows up playing all sports and goes to the University of Tennessee as a walk-on to play football. College life does not suit this young man. And one day he is hanging out in a friend's dorm room and that friend has a Sports Illustrated sitting out, which just happens to be the famous one with Hulk Hogan on the cover. The friend says, hey Neil, you're a big ham. Why don't you go be a pro wrestler? The light went on for teenaged Neil Hargrove and he left college the very next day. When Neil got home the next day, his parents were perhaps understandably a little bit perplexed as to why he was not in Nashville at college. And he hit them with the words every parent no doubt always hopes they hear. Mom, dad, I'm going to be a pro wrestler. This was a far cry from their preferred occupation for Neil as accountant, but they were very supportive. They said, if you're gonna do it, you'd better do it. And don't come to me in three months and tell me this isn't for you. But from there, Neil Hargrove had the wrestling bug, heading down as much as possible to Nashville's National Fairground Sports Arena to see Jerry Lawler, Jimmy Hart, Dutch Mantel, Bill Dundee, Austin Idol, and Jackie Fargo, who was, according to Hargrove, the Hulk Hogan of the South at the time. This was, of course, Memphis wrestling, the territory run by Jerry Jarrett, father of famous WWF and TNA wrestler Jeff Jarrett. They would run events every Saturday night with uh, Jarrett's wife, Jeff's mother, Christine Jarrett, working the ticket booth. It was there that Hargrove inquired about training, and Christine told him, quote, go talk to Tojo. Tojo was Tojo Yamamoto, who by now had been wrestling over 30 years, and in fact had helped to train Jerry Jarrett himself in the ring. Other notable former pupils of Tojo included Jeff Jarrett himself, Bobby Eaton, Tommy Rich, the aforementioned Jackie Fargo, the Moondogs, and Sid Vicious. With some difficulty, Neil convinces Tojo to train him. And he is, in fact, the last wrestler Tojo ever trained. Now, wrestlers in this era we know were basically insane human beings. Uh, training was rough and brutal and intended to weed out people who were anything other than singularly dedicated to joining this bizarre fraternity. Bill DeMott was fired from NXT for behavior that, let's be honest, would have likely been right at home in this era. There, there's a lot about wrestler behavior that just simply doesn't make sense from the outside. You know, listen to Paul Heyman talk about going down the road with Sting and the Steiner brothers and throwing things out their rental cars at each other. It's wild. You just wouldn't do this in the, in the year of our Lord 2020. We've already heard in previous Jobber Chronicles episodes how brutal training would be in this era, and Tojo was absolutely no different. Hargrove went to training with a friend who, after just a few hours, was puking in a garbage can. He was done, but Hargrove kept going. Again, things are probably a little bit different these days. You know, as my man The Undertaker said on Joe Rogan's podcast recently, where guys and gals are paid to train, and as we said, Bill DeMott got fired for being a little bit too hard on students. Now, I'm not saying that was right or wrong, it's obviously a very different era, but Bill DeMott probably behaved that way because to an extent, that's how he was taught. Just my opinion, take it or leave it. Anyways, that first month was basically just Hindu squats and running, and it was four weeks of training before they ever got into the ring. Hargrove, in fact, trained 18 months before Tojo finally said, all right, you're ready. From there, in Hargrove's words, he worked every podunk fair, National Guard armory, and high school gym in Tennessee, eating tuna for dinner and selling gimmicks after the show for close to two years, all with the singular vision of eventually reaching the World Wrestling Federation. And if this sounds a little bit like The Undertaker talking on Joe Rogan about his own come up, yeah, that just seems to be kind of how things were done back then. Finally, the World Wrestling 
Wrestling Federation itself came to town, specifically to the Nashville Municipal Auditorium. He took his picture portfolio and went to the building's back door before the show. Inside, Neil was instantly starstruck. Here was Hulk Hogan, Rick Rude, Andre the Giant, Randy Savage, Basically, every wrestler then currently at that time on national television. A security guy stopped him, and young Neil Hargrove told this man that he had a meeting with Vincent Kennedy McMahon. This did not work. Afterward, he went back to his father's auto body paint shop where he'd been working during the day, and my man finds a FedEx envelope in one of the cars, suddenly getting a bright idea. So he goes back to the Nashville Auditorium, taking a different back door, uh, holding the FedEx envelope so it doesn't look opened, and he tells the first guard to approach him that he has a delivery for the very same Vincent Kennedy McMahon, but he has to sign for it. <laughs> uh, incredibly, the security guard buys this, and he gets passed from guy to guy, you know, again, admits to uh, all kinds of the world's biggest stars wandering around backstage, oh, there's Bobby Heenan, oh, there's Rick Rude. Somehow, Neil manages not to lose his mind, and finally he gets passed to a guy who obviously has some kind of pull. He doesn't recognize him, but everybody's kind of giving him deference. The guy asks Neil what he does, and Neil, perhaps a little bit insulted, says, I wrestle. I've been wrestling for two years. The man asks Neil who trained him, and he says Tojo Yamamoto, and instantly uh, this man kind of takes Neil a little bit more seriously, and uh, he tells him that if he wants a tryout, he could be on the show the next night. It turned out the man he was speaking to was none other than Terry Garvin. Uh, certainly a controversial figure from the era, but also certainly a person with power behind the scenes in the World Wrestling Federation of the 1980s. So Neil calls his buddy Chip Carroll, invites him to go to Bristol with him, and they head up to Viking Hall. Uh, early so as to meet with Terry Garvin before the show. Chip and Neil are blown away by the production trucks and just the sheer scope of a WWF show, which Neil later compared to looking like a KISS concert. And if you've been to a WWE show today, uh, it's the exact same. Just row after row of semis with the modern stars plastered all over the sides. Uh, real talk one time at a SmackDown here in my current town of residence. Uh, my buddy and I were walking up to the building and we saw, frankly at an extreme distance, uh, Paige outside in her ring gear uh, talking on the phone and smoking a cigarette. It was weird, you know, it was kind of like uh, like being a kid and seeing your teacher at a restaurant like drinking a beer or something. You know, we didn't bother her or nothing, but that was kind of wild. The first match of Neil Hargrove's WWF career is against Hercules Hernandez, who Hargrove said is one of the nicest people who he ever met in wrestling. Managed by Bobby the Brain Heenan, one of the biggest stars in the world and the greatest person ever in the history of wrestling, in my opinion. Uh, Neil went out to the ring first and watched the enormous Hercules make his way to the ring from seemingly 100 yards away. Neil Hargrove, who was perhaps one-third Hercules size, uh, began to wonder if he had made the biggest mistake of his young life. It had to feel a surreal moment, you know, to, to suddenly have Bobby the Brain Heenan Heenan. Bobby the Brain Heenan trash-talking him from ringside, as Hercules Hernandez proceeded to beat the absolute stuffing out of him. Neil did make one mistake in the match, as uh, Hercules, calling the, the match, as is the, the veteran's prerogative, uh, told him don't move, but Neil heard move, so he moved, resulting in him getting knocked out in his first match. Hercules rolled him out, carrying him to the back like a sack of potatoes, and uh, dropped him into a chair to allow him to recover. Once he was awake, but uh, still rather foggy-headed, albeit uh, feeling, in his own words, violated, uh, Hercules came up to him, excited as all hell, and said, Hey brother, that was great. Good luck to you. And Garvin then approached Neil Hargrove and said, Kid, if you can survive that, come on up to Winston-Salem for a match with Ron Bass. Thus, Neil Hargrove became Reno Riggins. Now, Bass was uh, functionally identical to like a Stan Hansen, or maybe a JBL from a later era. You know, a rough and tumble, brutal looking brawler cowboy. But uh, Riggins said that uh, very ironically, he worked light as a feather. Riggins said he didn't feel a thing. Uh, JBL would be disgusted. We should probably take a very brief pause here to explain precisely what it is that Riggins meant by that last comment. Working light as a feather. We have talked before about works and shoots in previous episodes of the Chronicles. In short, a work is intended to appear real to the audience while a shoot actually is real. And the despicable worked shoot is a work intended to appear to the audience as a shoot. To work yourself into a shoot is to get so into the depicted reality you are portraying that it ends up becoming actual reality. Most punches in pro wrestling are of course worked punches. A pile driver is worked because if you actually did that to somebody, you would kill them. Like, we all know that. That's obvious. Some of my very favorite wrestlers in history were known for being what is called stiff. That is, perhaps going a little bit beyond the concept of a worked strike and actually legitimately striking their opponent. Also known in wrestling as laying it in. Vader, Brock Lesnar, and Stan Hansen leap immediately to mind. On the other side, uh, the workers who worked light as a feather, just for a few examples, uh, The Rock, John Cena, Randy Orton, and Shawn Michaels all come immediately to mind. Uh, the latter of whom 
in fact, despised working with Vader due to their uh, very distinct uh, difference in their wrestling philosophies, if you will. And that's putting it kindly. Kind of in the middle, you have a guy like Bret Hart, who worked stiff, but uh, never once hurt his opponent in the ring. The Goldilocks just right temperature of stiffness. Working stiff nowadays has become like some kind of badge of honor, such that wrestlers will post pictures of their damaged bodies on social media after their match to kind of like prove their legitimacy and maybe enhance their gravitas with a certain sector of the fans. It is such a badge of honor that Japan has developed an entire wrestling style around it. You know, so-called strong style, a subset of puro resu. Uh, the most obviously recognizable proponent of this style to American fans is probably Shinsuke Nakamura. If you want your humble narrator's opinion, I think it's just a little bit silly, and it's probably fairly influenced by the growth of mixed martial arts. Which of course owes a great deal to professional wrestling and its packaging and production strategies. Stiffness, again, it, just my opinion, has very little to do with being a good pro wrestler. But I am just some idiot on the internet. The point is, when Reno Riggins says Ron Bass was light as a feather, that's what he means. So after his match with Bass, Terry Garvin comes to Rena Riggins and says, if you come work for us, you're not gonna get pushed, but you'll make more money than you're making right now. Go back home and in two weeks, we will send you a booking sheet. Do we all know what a push is? In brief, if you are pushed in wrestling, you begin to win more matches and get more of a reaction from the audience. More cheers if you are a babyface and more boos if you are a heel. You might think of this as a push up the ladder of the card, uh, the opposite of a burial where you perhaps begin to lose more matches and find yourself buried down the card, further and further from that hallowed main event summit. But Reno Riggins takes the job with the World Wrestling Federation at 20 years old. Riggins tells a story of flying to St. Louis so he can drive to a show in Springfield, Illinois, but they don't rent cars to 20 year olds. He calls the office in a panic thinking he's going to miss the show and they tell him, don't worry, just head over to gate 17. Ron Garvin and Terry Taylor will be there shortly. Introduce yourself and ride with them. So he goes and introduces himself to Garvin and Taylor and the two upper mid carters ask him what he'd like them to sign, thinking he is a fan. Uh, to which Riggins replies, uh, no, I'm not your fan, I am your co-worker. Garvin asks him if he has a driver's license, and when he says yes, Garvin says, well, we got our driver for this loop. Because if you're not driving, you can be doing whatever else that might have impaired your ability to drive. <coughs> <Ahem. laughs> Riggins has very fond memories of this time in his life. He loved working guys like Mr. Perfect and Bret Hart, and they liked working with him, because he was obviously a little bit more athletic than, uh, say, the One Man Gang or the Earthquake. Although John Tenna, it must be said, was a very badass athlete in his own right, a legit great sumo wrestler in, in another life, but that's beside the point. When we say athletic, when Reno Riggins says athletic, obviously we mean small, quick dudes who you can throw around. Riggins uh, certainly preferred to work the littler guys. Uh, he recalls one house show where Perfect was supposed to work Savage in the semi-main, but Savage was hurt, so that didn't happen. But Perfect selected Riggins to work with. He calls Perfect a pro's pro, a man who didn't care at all about the pecking order, and they tore the house down with a half-hour match. He tells a great story about Owen Hart, and who doesn't have a great story about Owen Hart, who was, of course, by all accounts, uh, the wrestling world's foremost practical joker. They were at the airport, and Reno was looking for his passport, but suddenly couldn't find it. Owen was there immediately, showing a face of nothing but deep concern, and then Owen actually helps him look for it, uh, delaying the flight for 15 minutes. This was obviously uh, pre-September 11th uh, flight protocols. Then suddenly Owen is uh, the one to find the passport, suggesting to me, suggesting to Rena Riggins himself, uh, suggesting to anyone who has ever heard a single story about Owen Hart that Owen had it the whole time and had chucked it at the ground only to be the savior and find it and save the day. Riggins also has very kind words to say about The Undertaker, who used to live very close to him in Tennessee. Reno remembers a time when his uncle had a birthday, and he went backstage with one of those old school huge VHS camcorders, you know, asking the big stars to cut a birthday promo for his family member. Uh, those who jumped in on the birthday video for Reno's uncle included the Bushwhackers, Owen Hart, Shawn Michaels, and the late great Paul Bearer. There was some question as to whether The Undertaker would, because he was so very protective of kayfabe at the time, and really for all those years until he retired this year. But The Undertaker sought Reno out to do a quick little birthday card for his uncle. Cool move, he didn't have to do that. Very nice guy. He also had extremely kind words to say about Lanny Poffo, uh, another pro's pro who had respect for everybody. Reno calls him a great wrestler who always worked to the best of his ability, who didn't care if the guy he was wrestling was the bottom of the totem pole. Lanny and Owen Hart would work as hard as if they were wrestling for the WWF title. Reno also has kind words about Vince McMahon, which, uh, frankly, not all of his employees do. Uh, Reno is, uh, like uh, Dwayne Gill, like uh, several of the people we've talked about on this show, uh, a very generally positive person, so maybe this should not be so much of a surprise, but uh, Reno said that he took his job willingly and did his best while he was there, and Vince was uh, very fair with him and paid him more than he'd ever made anywhere else. You know, they straight up told him he was not going to be a champion, but he made a business decision to work there for the money. 
looking at the roster today, you have to think there's probably quite a few people who are doing the exact same thing. He in fact says he wishes he was uh, 20 again, so he could go back and take the ride again. At the close of his World Wrestling Federation career in 1992, uh, besides those already mentioned, Reno Riggins had wrestled Ric Flair, Harley Race, Bret Hart, Arn Anderson, Razor Ramon, and Hulk Hogan. This was by no means the end of his wrestling story, as he moved on to USWA where he enjoyed likely the greatest competitive success of his professional career, winning the USWA Southern Heavyweight title from Brian Christopher in August of 1992. Uh, Brian Christopher, of course, being the son of uh, Jerry the King Lawler. He briefly worked in Jim Cornette's Smoky Mountain in 1993, before returning to the WWF in the Raw era, appearing on several episodes of what remains to this day the promotion's flagship television. In 1997, in Music City Wrestling, he teamed with Stephen Dunn, uh, late of teaming with Timothy Well as Well Dunn in the WWF, aka the Southern Rockers of Don Owen's Pacific Northwest Wrestling. After working the first Brian Pillman Memorial Show in 1998, he and Dunn teamed as Main Event in 2000, challenging for and winning the NWA World Tag Team titles at a show in Escon, Saudi Arabia in April of that year. Also that year, Reno Riggins produced Main Event Championship Wrestling, which featured such WWF alums as Yokozuna, the Head Shrinkers, Stan Lane, and the Honky Tonk Man. This may have been halfway a joke, but Reno Riggins is reasonably certain he might have inspired total non-stop action Impact Wrestling. As is often the case with enhancement talent from this era, uh, Mario Mancini certainly comes to mind. Had Hargrove's athletic window opened a decade later in the era of Rey Mysterio, Chris Jericho, and Eddie Guerrero, or even a decade after that in the era of Daniel Bryan and CM Punk, his wrestling fortunes likely would have been very different. But as we know, in the pre-steroid trial WWF, uh, size was king. And with very few exceptions, an average sized person couldn't hope to get any kind of serious push. Randy Savage was on the smaller side for wrestlers who were successful in this era, and he was billed at 6'2", nearly 240 pounds. It was the era of giants. Uh, the math is simple. But Reno Riggins stayed true to his convictions and made a bunch of money and got out with his health intact. These days, he runs the same paint and auto body shop that he worked at as a child in Nashville. He seems to spend a fair amount of his free time coaching Little League Baseball and watching his teenage sons play sports who seem to have inherited his natural athletic ability. Reno Riggins had one of those careers that you can't help but consider a complete success. Like I said, you ain't gotta be LeBron James to be successful. You can be Steve Blake. You ain't gotta be Joe Montana. You can be Dana McElmore. That's still a pretty incredible accomplishment. For the Jobber Chronicles, I am the world-renowned sports guy. Be good, kiddos. I'm out. <laughs>